MAGA World's circular firing squad is forming. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson and tonight's show. We've got a little MAGA gossip to talk about. Um, we also have Fred Wellman, who is the executive director of the new group, The Beer Hall Project. And he's going to talk about what happened during the failed coup in 1923, the Nazis failed coup, Hitler's failed coup, that thing, and how it's uh, how it relates to what's going on today. So stay History tuned. For... Rhyme, but it wraps with a fat beat, as they say. <laughs> yes, as they say. And and maybe one of these days we'll get Rick Wilson to rap over a fat beat. We've no. had these discussions on <laughs> But it, but that's not happening tonight. So stay tuned. Rick has an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Fred coming up. But first, we're going to do headlines. Rick Wilson, a lot has happened since uh, our show on Tuesday. And I feel like because we had such a powerful guest, we had Michael Weiss on, who is a, a veteran war reporter, fresh off of his time in Ukraine. Yep. He had firsthand knowledge of and firsthand accounts of what he saw over there. So, you know, we were really focused on that. And anyone, if you guys want to go back and watch the show, you can. It's on demand on YouTube. And um, I encourage you to do it because his his firsthand accounts are riveting. Um, but we didn't really, we gave kind of short shrift to some of the uh, MAGA implications of Trump's behavior and endorsements that came out over the weekend, particularly in the Pennsylvania Senate race, which is one of the most hotly contested Senate races in the country. And it has really pit MAGA world against each other. People, are, their heads were blowing off because Trump decided to endorse Dr. Oz instead of Dave McCormick, who is the more palatable general election candidate that Mr. most McCormick's people guy. think. Right. That's right. So um, because of that, I'm hearing now that there not only were some of Trump's loyalists working for McCormick, you had Stephen Miller over there, you had uh, you had Hicks. Hope Hicks, Kellyanne was doing work, from what I understand. Um, and I think McCormick was down in Mar-a-Lago to kiss the ring. And McCormick's wife- yeah, kissing the ring. Well, <laughs> I don't want the image, Rick. I don't want the image. Um, McCormick's wife, just so folks know, is Dina Powell, who worked for Trump in the White House for the first year. She came. And, with, she came from Bush World, folks. Yes, and she's a Goldman Sachs person now, so yeah, yeah, very Bush. establishment. And um, so I'm hearing now that. David Urban, who is a, uh, I, I've had some run-ins with Mr. Urban when we were CNN contributors during um, Trump time. Um, I find him to be incredibly obnoxious and um, not a shocker. And uh, Dina Powell have been confronting some of the people that were MAGA folks to make sure that they still support McCormick. Now that Trump has endorsed Oz, they're like scrambling around like, you better not rescind your endorsement now. And David Urban was like telling people off at RNC meetings. Like it's it's juicy to watch. I hope that, that this internecine warfare just keeps them all knocked off kilter and we can watch them implode. I, 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 I look forward to it with enormous pleasure because, <laughs> you know, McCormick is a lot like Glenn Youngkin. He thinks he can play the MAGA role in MAGA world and the sweater vest suburban affluent dad with everybody mm -hmm. else. You don't get to do that anymore. And Dina Powell should know better because she was up close and personal with this stuff. And, you know, this is a woman who was comfortable on both sides of the aisle. She's very moderate Republican, George W. Bush world Republican. I like Dina Powell. Very, you know, very old time Washington operators type. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she thinks you can get in bed with the, with, with Stephen Miller yeah. and Hope Hicks and come out of it, you know, not smelling like like old cheeseburgers <laughs> and, and, and failure and despair, yeah, it's maddening. And and so you know, McConnell has invested a lot in David McCormick. Um, he really wants him to be the guy um, because they would really like to pick up pencil or really like to, to hold Pennsylvania. Um, in, in the coming Senate contest. And look, this is a state that has a lot of volatility right now. It does. And if it is Dr. Oz, wow, you've got a hell of a weird race. Yeah, if it's Oz against Fetterman um, on the Democrat side and 
I just don't, it's, yes. And I've talked about this on, on uh, cable news about how Pennsylvania yep. is a state to watch as far as demographics are concerned, as far as the fact that we know right now, currently, Republicans are converting Democrats to Republicans yep. four to one over Democrats snagging Republicans in registrations. That's yep. bad. Even though there's still like, I think, half a million uh, more registered Democrats and Republicans, but this sure. will be the narrowest margin between the two parties in decades in Pennsylvania if that continues. So there's a lot happening um, in the state of Pennsylvania. So this, all of the dynamics of all of this are fascinating to me. But you know what else is fascinating to me is what's happening in Ohio. So we've now heard today that the, the rumor mill is that Trump is going to endorse, throw his endorsement behind J.D. freaking Vance, right. which is just unbelievable considering that jd vance was a never trumper who voted for our friend evan mcmullen yep. in 2016 along with me um i did that too and many others um and now he's tried to reinvent himself into this you know to try to outflank the other magas in this senate race right. and it hasn't been going so well for him because he's been stuck in third place and you've got Josh Mandel and this other guy Gibbons, and then the, the, the Timken, who is the the Jane Timken, right? Is that her name? Right. Um, okay. you know, they're all trying to to you know vie for this because it is a winner take all primary, unlike some other right. primaries where you have There's to no get plurality. Yeah. There's no That's, runoff. There's no yeah. runoff. If you have to get fifty plus one, then or if you don't, then there's a runoff. That's Not bad. in Ohio. It's one shot. So now we hear that JD Vance may get Trump's endorsement, and JD Vance has been backed by. Don Jr. and some of the others. Peter Thiel. Right. A, a lot of money from Peter Thiel. Um, yep. By the way. He's one of Peter, Peter Thiel's blood boys. And if, you, if you ever watch Silicon Valley, you'll get the reference. Yeah, which is a hilarious show, by the way. Um, funny as hell. <laughs> Silicon Valley, I forgot about that show. Um, but Peter Thiel, I just read a really fascinating bio um story about him and he is a bad guy that and it doesn't surprise me that he's a pro trump guy because he's another one that had a lot of grievance from his childhood and being picked on yeah. and and now he's he's got some power and he's going to use it and it's um those are the worst kind and he's got the money to do it so keep an yeah, eye he, on what peter teal is doing he's a guy with he's a guy with with several billion ways to uh to cause trouble in this election cycle yeah and and, and i think it's important to, for people to know you know, as much as as much as um, as much as they they think that that these techno libertarians are going to be their their saving grace, mm -hmm. a great book about Teal called The Contrarian. I read yes. it. Yes, yes. And he's not a, he he's a weird and 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 very bitter and very dark guy. Yes. Um, and I don't think I don't think a lot of traditional Republican social conservatives understand who Peter Thiel is. No, they don't. And, um, and even, even I wasn't fully clear on where he came from and what his motivations were. Okay. And after reading this, I, I said to myself, wow, okay, this guy is dangerous. Um, and something that stood out to me is that in a book that he wrote in 2009, he said that he doesn't believe that the that democracy in the concept of democracy anymore. Right. Like he doesn't think that it's right. a worthy thing to pursue. That is not, I don't understand how that aligns with what Republicans are supposed to stand for, supposed to. Um, this is a guy that's backing candidates. So, and he's backing JD freaking Vance. Um, and this is causing all kinds of, again, ruffling feathers. Josh Mandel and his people hit the roof. They had a hissy fit when they found out that this is what Trump you, was Josh doing. Mandel, Josh Mandel is one of the weirdest. And this is a race full of weirdos. Yes, it is. A race chock full of weird mofos. You would think it was a Florida race. <laughs> you would think, right. You would think it was a Florida race. It's the common law wife and the alligator come into it. Right. But these guys, I mean, J.D. Vance, uh, you know, went from being a moderate working class, you know, writer of these of this of this, you know, very well heralded book about, you know, the 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 working class in Appalachia. Yeah, Hillbilly Elegy. They made a movie. Being a complete bonkers conspiracy theorist, MAGA crazy, COVID conspiracy crazy guy, and. And a lot of people that I that I knew for a long time thought JD Vance was a serious thinker and all these other things. No, he's just he's he's bought in. He's he drank the poison. Yeah.
Yeah, it's um, it's pretty remarkable. He's one of the I, I call him the Ted Cruz of the Ohio race. Um, yeah. And it's he'll say and do anything, anything to get elected. Anything, yeah. however, whatever it takes to win, et yeah. cetera. Um, briefly, before I switch over to a little Ukraine news, um, speaking of trying to do anything to win, you got Governor Abbott down here in Texas pulling these stunts with immigration because we already know that immigration is going to be one of the top issues for Republicans. They are going to nationalize this issue. Caravans. Yes. I mean, you're going to hear, and it's only April. And we already know that there have been 80 immigration ads run across the country right. um, in places that don't have anything to do with the border. They've already, the, the RNC and others are already running these ads because they want to nationalize immigration to scare all the white folks that brown people are coming across the border. Um, At least Stefanik wants to seal the southern border. So obviously, New York and Pennsylvania would be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I am a border. Of law. New Jersey. Yeah, exactly. Like they need to worry about my Jersey folks. Get out of here. But anyway, um, I mean, listen, I am a border security hawk. Actually, I worked on this issue on in Capitol Hill for seven years when I was up there. I have very strong feelings about it, but I also understand the human toll. And what Greg Abbott is doing, he is exploiting these people who are trying to come here um, for a better life. And we can't let everybody in, and we understand that. We've got to fix our immigration system. It is a freaking mess. But what Greg Abbott is doing is just shameful. He is bussing some of these folks who have come over to claim asylum and bussing them to, Cap to, to Capitol Hill, he, to, to Washington, D.C., right. and dropping them off. And He's guess where? He's violating federal law. He's now a human trafficker. Right. You can't. Good point. You actually cannot do that. Um, and guess where they dropped them off? To Capitol. No, in front of, well, 400 North Capitol Street is the address. And guess who is, whose offices are there? Fox News. That's where their studios are here in Washington. Well, there's a shocker. And guess who had cameras there ready to go? I can't, I can't imagine how that happened, Tara. I mean, it is so exploitive. I can't even, I can't. And so, or exploitative, what's the word? But you know what I mean. Exploit, yeah. Um, it's wrong. It's just wrong what they're doing. And it is... If you don't believe me that this is not going to be nationalized by Republicans, just check out Nancy Mace's ad from South Carolina, Republican. <clears throat> she just put out an ad where she is walking along the southern border. Last time I checked, South Carolina and her district isn't along the southern freaking border. Not not, not as far as my geography lessons no, go. No, I mean, maybe Trump thinks it is because he can't find anything on a map. Trump, but yeah, yeah um, but she's over here trying to... <laughs> trying to say that somehow uh, Biden's mandate of, of vaccines in the military is is a sign of weakness and it's unpatriotic and how but Biden's willing to let all these illegals flood into the country and we have to vote, you know, Republicans back in. It's craziness. But this is a preview of what the Republicans are going to do nationalizing this issue. So Democrats, for the love of God, please. You, you, you got to pay attention to this and push back on it or else it's it's yeah. going to sink you. It is a poison kiss of death issue for Democrats going into November on top of everything else. I mean, and there are ways there are ways to turn it around. Like yes. Greg Abbott sealing the border for trucking at right. Laredo has caused enormous economic har hardship, not to not to immigrants, but to American truckers. Yeah, we're stuck for 30 hours. American businesses in Texas. And he's had to walk that back. But, you know, if Beto was was on the ball here, he would be pounding away on that issue right now because it is just basic douchiness <laughs> and an attempt to, you know, uh, an attempt to tr basically engage in government by trolling. Yeah, that's right. Because it's all these people are interested in. And they're yeah. weaponizing the what what the, the sacrifices that everyday Americans are going through because this disrupts the supply chain. Um, the truckers are, from what I read, stuck for thirty hours in some instances because right. it's clogged up the border crossing. And so they don't have. Off, they the they should be. I mean, it's not right. And I, um, I seem to recall we were told the, a few weeks ago that truckers were were the voice of the American working <laughs> class. We had to listen right. to what they had to say, mm -hmm. but then Greg Abbott, um, you know, puts up a roadblock to cause them enormous economic harm to, to for uh, political exploitation of yeah. Im of the immigration issue. Um, and, and, you know, it's just I just can't with these people, but we can't you know, this is this is re the reality that we're facing. Um, switching gears a little bit, though, to Ukraine, there's a little bit of good news uh, coming out of Ukraine. And I think that our viewers will appreciate what has happened. Um, 
you remember our, our uh, uh, Lincoln Project fundraiser with the poster? Sure. Remember Russian warship, go fuck yourself. From oh, those, yeah. From those brave uh, Ukrainian soldiers who are on Snake Island, who are uh, down there in the, is the mm -hmm. Sea of Aslov or Black Sea, one of them down there in the southern part. $45,000 for Ukraine. How uh, much? Posters. Like the 45000 like that. Was it that much? Well, yeah, even that, so. we that's sold great. A lot of them. I know that we sold them. We sold out really fast. A hundred percent of it went to Ukraine. That's right. We sold out of them really fast, and we did another reprinting, and they were gone. I have one. Uh, I was I was able to snag one. Well, why am I bringing this up again? Well, do you remember who they told to go that Russian warship? Go fuck yourself. Oh yes. You know what it was called? It was called the Moskva. It was indeed. And guess what's happened to the Moskva? Oh, the Moskva had a bad night last night. It did. It actually kind of fucked itself. Um, <laughs> or did it? Well, the Russians claim that it was a fire, but the Ukrainians yeah. are claiming that they took it out. But the uh, bottom I, line I is say, that was I, I, say, I, I tweeted this last night. I was like, the Russian explanation is basically that the Moskva <laughs> ran into a wall of high explosives and a fire <laughs> broke out. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, this is the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. It is an enormously important airborne control center. Uh, it's, it had enormously powerful radar systems on it. And now the other Russian naval uh, vessels in the area, they're headed out of range of these Neptune missiles that the Ukrainians supposedly used on it because they don't want to get whacked. Right. And now they don't have the same eyes and ears that they had with the Moskva. And... It is, look, this, this, there is no American equivalent of, of that ship right now. It would be like the, like the, 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 you know, USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier being sunk. Right. Yeah. And, and, and was, the Russian explanation for this, that it was a fire that broke out. Yeah, sure. First of all, we can't believe a word that these people say, right? The Russians are so full of shit, but you just have to look at the actions of the of what they're doing with their navy, right? Like you just mentioned, they're pulling some of their ships back. They wouldn't be doing that if it was just a fire that had nothing to do with the Ukrainian forces. So that well, just shows you that their rhetoric doesn't match their actions. You know, there there are conflicting reports right now of whether the ship sank or not, but but the Pentagon today confirmed that what they can see of it, the damage is is very extensive. And look, a fire on a warship that is not under control in one hour is going to cause a degree of damage that makes it completely combat ineffective. Yep. That ship right now is probably waiting on the yellow and green tugboats <laughs> from the John Deere division of the Ukrainian Navy to yeah. tow the shore. <laughs> That's right. They, they had a bad night. And, and look, it also shows that the Ukrainians are leveraging their own technology and their own their own style of war fighting in a way that, look, the Russians felt very confident out there in the Black Sea. Uh, they felt very yeah. confident they could assemble these standoff, these standoff weapon systems. And look, the, the Moscow was one of the, one of the ships that was, you know, launching cruise missiles. Which it doesn't normally do, by the way. Right. I, what I, it's supposed to be a defensive ship. It's supposed to be like an right. anti-missile yeah. ship. So the the fact that it was being used for offensive purposes just goes to show you how you know nefarious the, the you know Putin is. But anyway, but some of the accounts were that the Ukrainians basically flew one of their Bakhtiar drones overhead, distracted the ship. The ship locked onto it, and at the same time they whacked it with a pair of these Neptune missiles, which are a Ukrainian made product. They just approved the manufacture of them in January mm -hmm. before the invasion. And so if those things are rolling off the line now and they have about a 250 mile range, that puts Russian uh, naval forces at risk throughout the entire Azov Sea and, in, in, and through most of the Black Sea. Yep. Certainly in the Sevastopol uh, port area on Crimea, which is a very important baseline for the Russians to protect. Mm -hmm. If, if they're at risk in those areas, we've just seen a brand new front open up in this war and one that I think is, is yeah. very, very problematic for the Russians. Right. And it's and Odessa is probably uh, breathing a bit of sigh of relief, too, because they're right. in the crosshairs as well. So but well, I also the, if you're a landing craft. If you're if you're a Russian uh, Marine or or special warfare officer, do you want to get in that landing craft? You know, these guys have these Neptune missiles now. Right. I don't think I don't think so. Um, but I also want to put it in perspective. We, 
We also know that there was another um, small victory for the Ukrainian army that they've uh, blown up a bridge that has disrupted this um, one of the Russian convoys, and they've taken credit for it. Of course, the you know Russians are claiming that that's not what happened, but we know you know well we have an idea. It hasn't been con- independently confirmed, but they're still wreaking havoc. However, the Russians still have in- extraordinary firepower and yep. more uh, capability than Ukraine. That's not and- over. It's right. It's not over. I mean, we'll take these victories now. These are battles, but the war is not won. So stay vigilant and we'll continue to support them. The United States just approved 800 mil was 800 million more in security support for them. So, you know, we're there. And I mean, I'm not going to say that. I don't know. My theory, I've seen a lot of spy movies and read a lot of spy novels. I think that there might be covert operations happening. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Well, I, I know one operation that is happening, apparently. Uh, I heard this from a, a defense person today. They're giving, basically, the Russians are being trained on these switch, or the, the Ukrainians are being trained on our switchblade drones. Yeah. And Kirby and didn't we, want to talk about those capabilities, by the way. We've 500 of them so far. Uh-huh. 300 in this new package, 200 and some odd before. And they're basically like flying your basic DJI Phantom drone they're pretty easily trainable mm-hmm. and, and for 50 grand a pop to kill a several million ruble tank. Um, Wor- well worth the money. Well worth the money. So it's well going to be get very sporty. And look, it, the Ukrainians need some heavy armor Absolutely. The different than the West part of the, in the North part of the country. But you know, again, the battle's not over. The Ukrainians are, are still posting up great scores on the board, uh, but we can't, we can't take our foot off the pedal now. Indeed. And um before we we bring in uh, you know your your interview with with uh, Fred Wellman, I just want to talk lastly about Trump on this issue. Sure. Um, he 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 shows up on Fox and does these call in these phone in interviews, which are just <clears throat> excuse me so obnoxious. And he was on Hannity because you know he's sitting in the bridal suite of Mar-a-Lago, Buck. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I don't. Again, will you cut it out with the images? For the love of God, Wilson. Oh, <sighs> focusing. Um, Trump is phoning in, talking to Hannity, and Sean Hannity has has at least covered the Ukrainian war a lot more honestly than fucker Carlson has, yeah. but um, to his credit at least, and he's asked Trump in the past before, like, how does he feel about the atrocities we're seeing on the ground? I mean, it's being documented. The world is seeing these these mass graves and these horrific images of torture and and calling it genocide. And you know, um, even Biden said so. Um, and it's awful. So Hannity asks Trump how he feels about this this evil and the B roll that's running during this is of horrific images of mass graves and death right. and just awfulness. And Trump's reaction is despicable. We have a rapid response to this. Do you respect Putin? I do respect him. I like Putin. He likes me. He's a leader. Okay. He's respected. So Putin is now saying it's independent, a large section of Ukraine. I said, how smart is that? President Putin is sharp. President Putin was a total gentleman. Putin called me brilliant. I like it. Of course he's smart. He is uh, strong and he's tough. Putin even sent me a present. Beautiful present. Here's a guy who's very savvy. I know him very well. I asked you the last time you were on whether you think that this is evil in our time. Do you believe this is evil in our time? I think in 100 years, people are going to look back and they're going to say, how did we stand back and NATO stand back, which in many ways I've called a paper tiger. Don't forget, I rebuilt NATO because when I became president, the first thing I noticed when I went there to the first meeting was that most of the countries were not paying. So put Donald Trump still cannot bring himself to criticize Vladimir Putin. Hannity gave him the opportunity again. silver platter, Tara. And he still, instead he goes on this diatribe about NATO and himself, and we all know that's bullshit. He wanted to dismantle, he wanted to uh, pull us out of NATO and basically destroy it. Um, All of our allies knew that. So his nonsense about what he did for NATO to strengthen it is bullshit. 
and he still couldn't do it. He started talking about Volkswagens and and uh, Mercedes in Munich versus Chevys. It was disgusting. But this is who Trump is, and this is who he will always be. And Republicans, who all, like I said in my piece in NBC Think a couple weeks ago, they walk around with their you know Ukraine flag lapel pins, and they're all about promoting freedom in Ukraine and standing up for them. But yet they will not condemn this bastard who still continues to bootlick Vladimir Putin. It is a hell of a place for Republicans to be, but they have they have chosen their horse. And a lot of them spent the last couple of weeks, as we talked about on Tuesday, sort of thinking to themselves, well, you know what? I'm just going to be, I'm going to be pro-Ukraine-ish and we'll see what happens. And maybe we can get back to the, you know, isolationist nationalist populism game sooner than we think. And you know, well, if it goes wrong, we'll blame Biden. If it goes right, we'll blame Biden. Right. It's just, but you know what? They, you know who has been steadfast in his leadership? It is Joe Biden. And here at the Lincoln Project, we are want to remind people, we put out this really powerful ad to remind people of, of the gravity of the moment yeah. and what uh, President Biden has done and stepped up in his leadership. And we just really need to keep it in perspective. And we're going to roll this ad. And on the other side of it, Rick, you'll be taking over with your yeah, exclusive you interview with Fred. Day. So yeah. on that note, I want to wish everyone a happy Easter. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday. And here's genocide. People are dying on the front lines. You think it's a joke? Why do I care? Why do I care what's going on in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? We're not an ally of Ukraine. I keep saying ally, ally. We're not. We got this minx accord and the stuff kind of bouncing around. But we're not an ally. They're not an ally. Why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because which I am. About Vladimir Putin, you know, I analogize him to basically an authoritarian gas station attendant. Why does permanent Washington hate him so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Putin ain't woke. He is anti-woke. No, Vladimir Putin didn't do any of that. He's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. I said, how smart is that? In American terms, you would call Ukraine a tyranny. We've never been an ally of Ukraine. That's the strongest peace force I've ever seen. There were more army tanks than I've ever seen. They're going to keep peace all right. What the Russians did was an attack. I don't care. We could use that on our southern border. This is genius. I'm in the city of Bucha, and it's Kursov, the capital. What happened here and everywhere in Ukraine, what is happening, this is not special operation. This is not military objects. This is civilians. They've been shot in the head with the tight hands behind their back. This is genocide of the Ukrainian population. And that's exactly what Russian regime, Putin's regime, Russian army is doing, killing the civilians with the tight hands behind their back and with a shot in their heads. You know, folks, that was not an ad we loved making. That was not an ad, that was not an easy ad to make, but you know, we, we think it's important that as much as we have moments where, where you get to celebrate the bravery of the Ukrainians, we also have to remember that this is one front in a global war against authoritarianism and one edge of the spectrum. This is the 10 on the scale. We're fighting on the, on the, on the other end of the scale against the, an authoritarian movement here in America. And if people don't understand that, um, I'm hoping that my guest and good friend Fred Wellman can give us some perspective on on where we are historically and where we are militarily. Fred has some pretty unique insights into this kind of modern <laughs> warfare that, that we're in. But uh, before we do that, I, I don't know if everybody knows, Fred is a former combat helicopter pilot. And, sure. and you know, Fred, I, I got to say, if you were a Russian helicopter pilot, would you feel very comfortable right now? 
<laughs> they're having a they're having a bad couple of months, aren't they, Rick? It's great to be back with you, by the way. Yeah, that that adds gutting, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you've seen the effect of the British missiles, which are just devastating oh, with the, the high speed yeah. missiles. You know, with our missiles coming in, it, it is uh, stingers. I mean, it's it's not a great place to be a pilot right now. I mean, the fact that it's still contested airspace a month and a half into this thing really attests to the the, the ingenuity and the tactical strength of the Ukrainians. And you know, they learned their lesson in 2014. They uh, they they took to heart that the, that they were at war and they've trained and they they've worked with our allies. They work with our own uh, the California National Guard for goodness sake has a regular rotation that was training training Ukrainians and you can see it paying off. Their 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 tactical ability is 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 absolutely uh, remarkable. And uh, no, I I would not want to be flying a helicopter around that airspace at this point. It's not a very safe place to be. Yeah, between the stingers and the star streaks, man. The, the I, I watched I got in a YouTube hole on the star streak missile the other day. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so it's three tungsten darts going four yeah. times the speed of sound. Oh, and they're all explosively guided projectiles. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to be fun. there. You saw that one video where it just takes the tail right off the, the aircraft. It's uh, yeah, that's not you yeah. don't even know what hit you when you when you come out like that. So yeah, uh, you know, it's 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 seeing all this unfold in real time for me has been you know challenging. I, I'm not gonna lie. I, I I was dialing friends up who uh, have Ukrainian connections saying, what can I do? Put me in coach. And I, yeah, you're old, dude. Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but no, no, put me in. I'll lose weight. No, I, it's, uh, you know, you just want to fight. Um, you know, after 9-11, I remember, you know, I was a reservist uh, on when 9-11 happened. And I came, I, say, I sat home from work that day and I, I turned to my then wife and said, you know, I'm a soldier. Um, we're going to go to war. I got to go. And 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 I did, you know, my family, God bless them, you know, blessed me to to call up the army and say, bring me back in. And, you know, it's it's hard even in my advanced age and my gray beard not to to want to go to the sound of guns, but uh, but we do what we can. Like you said, we 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 recognize this moment. I I, I was a perfect entree, and I appreciate it. You know, this is a historic moment. This is a moment of the march of autocracy, which we've talked about as long as we know each other, Rick, is yep. there is a global march of autocracy. Putin has been under, un, you know, has been funding it, if you will, this whole time. Mm -hmm. He's been a, driving it from Brexit to Trump to, you know, a lot of the world's problems have been part of this global march of autocracy. And and this is this is the actual hot war that we're in now. But it, but it's no different than the war we're fighting here in a lot of ways. The same, as you said, the same autocratic movement that we're seeing across our own country is still continuing uh, since, since uh, well, since Trump's ascension, but especially since January 6th. Right. And I mean, I think here in America, we still have the opportunity to not have it be, to not have Correct. it require the level of heroism and, and personal danger that has been required of the Ukrainian people. Right. And, but, but there are forces in this country um, because history, as I like to say, you know, doesn't just rhyme. It, 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 it raps. As a and, familiar beat, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, you, your, your, your new organization, Beer Hall Project, is trying to educate people on, on just that, that, that risk factor that we have when there's a coup that doesn't get punished. And what happens? Absolutely. So, if you could tell us, tell us a little bit about the, the about the historical antecedents <laughs> of of the name of the of your project and how the, you the very subtle part of this whole thing. <laughs> The very subtle name. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, if you know your history, you know, November of, of 1923, uh, Hitler has taken charge of the, the, the nascent Nazi party. Um, has, has, has It's funny people forget he was a huge uh, fanboy of Mussolini. Yeah. Uh, Mussolini, just previous to that, had done his famous march to Rome where he took power and was, was appointed uh, to become the dictator in, the, in his fascist movement. So Hitler, Hitler thought he'd kind of repeat that. You know, he, he's a copycat. So he went to Bavaria. Uh, got the word that the uh, the three leaders of Bavaria were were meeting in the beer hall, the Burger uh beer hall. Yep. Um, went there with his stormtroopers, surrounded it, seized control, bundled these three men off, tried to convince them to join his coup to march to Berlin. Um, things went awry in the other part of the city. So, we, <laughs> ironically, he left his friend Gen General von Ludendorff, who you know wasn't that stable. Does this all sound familiar? <laughs> and so Ludendorff. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this. I'm hearing uh, echo here. Uh, General, yeah, it's weird. Um, so we left Ludendorff with these guys. They said, "Yeah, we're down, bro." And and Ludendorff, said, all right, great, you're out. Well, they left. They alerted the state police. They alerted the troops um, to meet them. So in the last ditch effort the next day, Hitler and Ludendorff led their stormtroopers to city center of Munich to try and seize one of the buildings. And they met the state troopers. And there was fire up broke out. Yep. Uh, 16 Nazis were killed, four police. Uh, and and in that good moment, ratio. Hitler fled. Yep, good ratio. Hitler fled, like, the, you know, twisted his ankle running away, mm -hmm. um, got caught, um, was put on trial. 
But the trial was they, they let him stay in Bavarian court where he had a lot of support still. Um, the court almost let him off. They had to con- the judges had to convince each other to actually convict him. They made this show trial where he actually increased. I, I literally read an article today that Trump's numbers with independence actually went up during his first impeachment. And and I was it, again, every time I read stories like this, I'm reminded that the Hitler's popular went up because of his trial for an attempted coup because he. Um, he, he, you know, they, they let him talk, they let him give his speeches. So he went in, they put him in minimum security prison where he right in Mein Kampf, where he had guests for God's sake. He had, he, he had, had, he had little soirees at his, at his yeah, at his, a little sweet. Yeah. But what the key is, and, and the thing we focus on the fear hall, because, you know, we all follow up, we, we focus on January 6th, we focus on the violence of January 6th. And I think there's a lot of people who just say, well, that was the high point. And, and, and our argument is very clear that, no, that was simply the first act. And, and it, it was the closing of, of the first act, if you will. And it was in, in many ways for Hitler, that was the closing of the first act. What Hitler decided while in jail was that 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 was not the path to power for him, that the Weimar Republic's very weak democratic institutions provided him the opportunity to manipulate those levers of power and make his way to, to power in a different way. So what did he do? He, he spent the next 10 years uh, working within the system as it existed, causing chaos in the streets with his stormtroopers and violence, mm-hmm. othering people to create enemies within, undermining the economy. I mean, a lot of that tends spreading disinformation. 10 years later, He's appointed chancellor. A month later is the Reichstag fire. A month later is the Enabling Act. He becomes a dictator. Yep. We know what happens to history at that point, right? So, so what we're saying a lot here at the the Beer Hall Project, and again, our name is is pretty damn blunt, and you'll, our logo is even even blunter, <laughs> uh, is is that very simple. We just want people to understand that there's historic precedent, and if we sit back and say, well, it just can't happen here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna fool ourselves. That that's there's a lot of people in Germany said it wouldn't happen there too. There's a lot of people who didn't take Hitler seriously, and then it became very serious. In fact, and so we're saying very very loudly that you can see the parallels here. You see the Proud Boys. You see the the the, the many laws being passed to roll back our voting rights. Some 400 laws of roll back voting rights. The controlling of education. Every day I'm, we're making memes up on our on our on our social media channels because yeah, there's always a parallel. Like, I mean, Mussolini said, you know, any given day at any moment, I know exactly what every student in Italy is being taught um that contr- no. he, he learned early fascism knows that controlling the education of children is controlling the future no and question. we see laws we've had. and so again and again and again in the moment we face here in the united states we're seeing these historic parallels and i think too many people just kind of burying their head in the sand and, and hoping it goes away so so really our goal you know you guys are brilliant but lincoln project uh, you know a proud of work we do that that video is gutting i can't produce any of that but we're hoping to figure out how do we reach there's some 27% of Americans who don't even, you know, we, we talk about this a lot, right? Ricky got left, right? You got independent. But you and I know there's also like 25% of Americans who are just like, peace out, bro. They're not even participating, right? They don't, they're like, <laughs> I don't, they are, right? Alone. I don't want to be involved in this. Right, right. I, I want nothing like, you know, and, and, and it was, I just I just worry about my pocketbook. And, and you know, historic precedent also tells us that dictators are really bad for the economy, <laughs> right? And so if you don't think terrible. your pocketbook's good, yeah, they're terrible. Your pocketbook's going to go to shit when you have a dictator, you know, closing down your company because it doesn't like the political views of your boss. And so we are very, we're, so we're really trying to, we're trying to raise money. We're trying to invest in, you know, doing that research, figuring out what the message is, working with other organizations to reach these people who are participating in our democracy. Because by God, if we don't all participate in our democracy, we're going to lose it. And and the historic yeah, presence true. there, and I don't want to sit. I, you know, I just don't want to. You know, remember I joke in speeches a lot, Rick. How I, I, you remember in Utah, we always used to joke about who we we're going to um, sleep with and, and and bunk up with in the gulags. Right. <laughs> you know, and, you know, right. Hunter, my son, my hot son Hunter, and I always argued he had to get the top bunk. I'm too old to call it the top bunk, but you know, that's you know, <laughs> you know, right. I just don't want to be. I don't want to be sitting in the gulag 15 years from now, wishing I'd done more. Um, and yeah, so that, that really drives me and my my co-founders. Well, I, I, that it's, it's, I think you guys are doing, you know, one of the things that I love about, about the folks that have, that have spread out from LP and started their own things there, we're all finding different segments of this fight. Nobody can, nobody yeah. can, nobody can grapple the whole big sticky ball of this thing. We've got to have right. a lot, many hands make light work on it. So, you know, I think you're, uh, I think you guys are doing great work. I think you really, and and you're doing something that, that, that the Democrats, I hope, really can get to understand. Is it putting one six in the faces of people who are either politically disengaged? It will shock the hell out of them. Yeah. Or if you end up with with that band of Republicans, you know, we used to call it the Bannon line, three mm-hmm. to eight percent of Republicans. Right. Which I think has expanded a little bit since 2020. 
Um, you know, those people do not want to be associated with the coup plotters and the crazies and the screamers. But the, you know, the historical precedent, you know, you know Hitler built these paramilitaries yep. in, the, in the interwar year, years. And so the, you know, the steel helmets and the, and the early, you know, SA types and the, the, the proverbial brown shirts, those people came out of groups that, that if Hitler was in a time machine, you go, I get what the Proud Boys are. Right. I see what the three percenters are. I, I know those people. Those are my people. I get it. So, and, and a shocking number of fellow veterans, right? Remember, it, it, people forget that the much of the nucleus of the Nazi early Nazi party, the, the brown shirts and the stormtroopers were um, unfortunately yeah. World War One veterans like Hitler himself, <laughs> like Ludendorff were veterans. And and you see those now. And and and, and as a veteran, I don't want to have those uncomfortable conversations about my peers. But we have to have some very uncomfortable conversations when over 10 percent of those who have been indicted for crimes on January right. 6th turn out to be military veterans, if not active duty military. I mean, my God, there's right. a Marine Corps major under indictment. Yeah. Just the door a, open, a, right. An he duty. drove up from Quantico, active yeah. duty major in the United States Marine Corps, field grade officer. So so we have to have some very uncomfortable conversations. And that's another part of what we're partnering with. And I think you may remember my colleague like uh, Chris Goldsmith, who's yeah, doing some remarkable work, you know, co you know, doing remarkable work to investigate. The, the origins and the work of the Proud Boys and the far right. Chris and I are partnering. Where, you know, we, he's actually going head to head with these guys, trying to undermine their work and and highlight the extremists in their ranks. So, right. so yeah, yeah, it's funny what you say. It really, you know, one of our big, one of the things I was really proud about our work in Lincoln Project is, is, and people don't. I think so many people just don't realize this. We're always coalition partners. We always work. Oh, yeah. we, we try to work with everyone, right? You know, we work with Midas. We work with uh, our, our, that wonderful Latina coalition we built. You know, we, we built these coalitions, the right? Across the country. And now you've got the union. Yeah. Right. And, and, right, and, so and the union, the union takes started everybody. bringing this together for 2022. So, yep. well, yep. Fred, so, I really appreciate you being here, you. brother. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in real life again at some point in the near future. And uh, as we were doing this, folks, we got the news that the Moscow has the Moscow has sunk. It is now great, great news alert in the Black it is, Sea. It is now a submarine. And, it is now uh, a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't it. lose another submarine. Well, Fred, he just, just, yeah, out, he's acquired a new one. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, you can actually use that line for real now. Oh, you no, know, I'm, I'm, trust me, I'll, I'll steal it. Yeah, All you right, know, but, it, it is. Um, it's remarkable the Ukrainians are doing, and yeah. and you know, and, and as you and Tara were saying earlier, we may never know the full story of what we are doing. I, I do have faith that our government is doing some really good things, and we may not know about it for years to come. Um, I do have faith that Ukrainians are doing very smart things to defend their country, and if yeah. we simply arm them and give them the training, and the and I'm, I'm thrilled to hear about the artillery going in and that those pieces of the puzzle. But but yeah. it's really gratifying to see. How and, and I met Ukrainians in, in you know, sure. they served with us in Iraq and Afghanistan, and and, of course you and, I, and to see them, you know, Alex Venman, who, yeah, you know, you, who, my good friend, you know, he has led this, he has led a, a lot of the American side of this, of this uh, advocacy fight, you know, because he feels it in his bones and his and his soul, um, yep. you know, and I, I just think, I think that the work the the Biden administration has done has been terrific. Yep. Uh, I think they've done more that more than they than than Trump would have even considered doing, frankly. Right. Because Trump would have said, "I might get a Trump Tower in Kiev. I don't know. I went. I, you know, maybe we should." <laughs> well, you know, it's been quiet though. I mean, it, it, it's funny. Let's be honest, right? Is, is I was I was a little nervous for a little while there, Mr. Biden. You know, he's a senator. Senators, I, right. I've never been a big fan of senator presidents. I'll be honest, you know, because they the, the uh, old time senators like Mr. Biden, they they they, they they've worked in coalitions. They like they believe there's still a chance of bipartisanship, oh, right? You know, they're very yeah, they're my they're, honorable they're, friend. They're, <laughs> right, right, exactly. You know, they deliberate. They're very deliberative. They want to go. Right. But if you think about one thing, I've said since this whole thing kicked off is it actually couldn't be a more what, what the Russians under underestimated is that this couldn't be a more perfect moment for Joe Biden. I mean, he's, he, first of all, he, he was a senator. He was on the foreign affairs Committee during the cold war. He knows this enemy. Yeah, right. he, he is big and building these coalitions. He's, he's not trying to be in front. You're not going to see him pull his way to the front of the picture, but he knows who the big dog is in this group. So he's, he's managed to corral our allies to do the right thing. Yep. And you've got Hungary participating in the, uh, in the, in the sanctions now and all these other things. You've got Germany, my God, Sweden, Finland joining freaking NATO. I mean, holy crap. <laughs> I mean, so, so you couldn't actually, in the end, have a moment more perfectly designed for someone with Joe Biden's resume uh, than what Putin has presented him. And, and I, I really do think that to include even me, I have underestimated him 
uh, Mr. Biden at this moment. I'm, I'm very happy to see what I'm doing. No, nothing's perfect. We're all going to find our ways. I, I talk a lot about in speeches. I was just speaking to some, the Democrat group here in Missouri uh, about, you know, Harry Truman. I mean, people forget Harry Truman became famous, uh, became vice president because his work in the Truman Committee, right? He ran the committee in the Senate to hold DOD and military contract to, to account for not doing the right things during World War II. I mean, there's famous stories of him showing up at, I think, Fort Leonard Wood that didn't exist, and it was supposed to exist at that point. It wasn't there. <laughs> and, and, and so the, I'm a big believer in holding our leaders accountable, um, yet hold, giving them credit where credit is due. And, I, I, and for me, I, 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 I think I can give a lot of credit to what the Biden administration is doing as, uh, awesome. as in, a, in, a, in this moment. Well, Fred, thank you, brother, for joining me. And uh, we'll be seeing you again soon. And uh, we'll look forward to it. From there. All right. All right. Good luck. Check out the Beer Hall Project, folks. That's the group Fred is heading now. And uh, you can follow him on Twitter at, at Fred Wellman. So that is all we have for tonight. I am here solo again. Once again, they've left me in charge of the machine. Fools. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching. Uh, do all the things you do on the internet, like and subscribe and all those things on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will see you again on Tuesday of next week. Have a great weekend and a, and a blessed Easter to all of you.